Hi, everyone. I'm Alexander McDonnell, and I'm interviewing Ted Rao. Is that how I say your name? Yeah. So Ted Rao is into sociocracy. Can you tell us about sociocracy? What is it exactly? Sure. Sociocracy is a governance method, really. So it's, hang on, uh, hang on. Um, we're a bit quiet. You, you, you were louder before. Um, I didn't change anything. Let me just speak up, maybe. Is that good yeah, enough? Yeah, then maybe okay. that's good enough. Okay, so uh, sociocracy is a governance method. So it's a way to give organizations a plan on how to decide who decides. How to uh, decide who decides. Exactly. So decide. Uh, what, what do we normally do? How do we normally decide who decides? Is it like whoever bought the business or something like that? Whoever's yeah, in charge? So there are typically three different ways that we see. One is um, just not making a decision about it. And just, you know, <laughs> if you imagine, for example, let's say eight people get together and they form some sort of project mm -hmm. and everybody's excited and, and all of that, then there will somehow be decisions made, but it might chronically be unclear who decides and how they decide. Right, that's a pretty common situation, and it typically what happens is that things fall through the cracks, or people um, have some other tension, but there's not really a way to bring it up because it's not clear how we got there in the first place. So that's one way of do doing things, sort of the non-decision kind of thing. Then also, what's tricky about this kind of decision-making method is that all the typical biases of you know, like the older they are, the more power you have, or men have more power than women. All of that kind of stuff tends to kick in a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Then another way of making decisions is, of course, the way we were raised, right? Hierarchical organizations where your boss can basically undo and override anything that you decide because you're just somebody in a hierarchy. Yeah. And then the other way, sort of the third way, is the very horizontal organizing with, um, with more of a plan than in my first example. And that's typically when everybody decides intentionally that they want to be decision makers on everything. So everybody in decides everything together. And sometimes that's then defined that they want to make decisions by consensus. So a decision is just made when everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. And that also comes with a lot of downfall. So all of those three methods come yes, with- Yes, I've, I've experienced how, how long it can take to make decisions in that way. Yes. And how tiring. Um, Okay, but, but sociocracy is another method again, yes? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so how would you do it in sociocracy? So in sociocracy, we try to um, combine really several things. It's, mm. So it's um, very appealing for those who believe that a well-defined system can make things a little better. Right. So one thing that we do is we put people into small groups. So okay. small groups make decisions. So we take all the things that can be decided in an organization, instead of giving it all to the boss that then delegates it, we say, okay, let's distribute it. Like, let's say those five people take care of this part and those five people take care of this other part and so on. So small groups, because now these groups of, let's say five or six or seven people can actually have meetings where they hear everybody. So it's different from those meetings where 35 people are in the same mm -hmm. room yelling at each other. Mm -hmm. So they can have more intentional meetings. But now these teams need to be combined in a way. So they, we need to have a way of how the, let's say the five people that are doing marketing, how they know what's happening in finances and so on. Right. So there's a way of combining those, or, um, connecting those teams by always having two people on the next higher circle and basically layering it all. And I typically, because typically often people think about hierarchy and they're already in freak out mode because it sounds like power over. <laughs> but the way we think about it is, um, Hierarchy in terms of like natural hierarchies, like a leaf as part of a branch, as part of a tree, as part of a forest. You know, marketing is part of something higher, son of something higher, something higher. So, so you everybody contributes where they feel most useful or where they have expertise and so on. But the hierarchy is not a power over hierarchy, but just something is a part of the next higher thing. So, have you come across the term holarchy? Yes. Yeah, so not such a commonly known term, but that's that's basically the official term for this concept. We all have these the different levels, and it doesn't mean that one is more important than another. They're just different. Um, brains work in that way too. We've got like the central part and the bits when they're outside, and they it's kind of a natural order of function, isn't it? Yeah. And the problem is that people typically have only 
looked at that when it comes to organize like organizing of people and organizations the way we think about it mm. they've only see seen those natural nesting of things in combination with power over with coercive power right. so in, in people's minds that always goes together but it doesn't have to go together at, at all right the, like let's say a small circle of people can just decide intentionally that they want to be part of something or a group can decide that they want to form a sub-circle and we can then balance those teams with each other, which is um, what we do in, um, just by the way we make decisions, for example, which is another topic. Okay, right. So uh, people watching us on Facebook, YouTube, if you've got questions, please put them in the comments. We will be able to get to them during the interview, hopefully. If we don't get too distracted by really interesting con conversation, which is quite a possibility here, because I'm fascinated by this, the similarities between what you're talking about and some of the areas that I've been interested in, such as cooperative business, where um, cooperatives are owned by all, all of the members of the cooperative, the whole group ownership. And so you can't have a boss who can just kick someone out. You've got, you've got to kind of arrange things between each other. And generally what I've seen is most co-ops actually have each individual kind of has their own thing that they're doing outside of the co-op and kind of links into the co-op. And so you can't tell that person what to do anyway because they're, it's their business or their project and they're actually in, in charge of it. So... A uh, co-op kind of naturally leads to this situation where we're trying to support and create something, some kind of group, but we're not able to enforce power over anyone. So we have to kind of find a way to coordinate rather than to boss. Right. And the way I would describe it is um, that we are all interdependent right mm. and then the sociocratic way of arranging circles and roles and how they're connecting and so on that's just basically a, a modeling modeling organizations to reflect that interdependence right, so right. every as exactly like you're saying and there are like co-ops and sociocracy that's a that's a really good blend of things really good blend. Um, everybody has that autonomy right in, in what they are doing that's exactly what we want mm -hmm. we want to put let's say the marketing circle would actually make the decisions in marketing and carry out the operations that goes together that's their thing um but we we also want to be able to connect with all the other things each of them sort of semi-autonomously and that's what the world actually looks like out there right and we just want to bring that very natural way of organizing back into organizations with some intentionality with it mm -hmm. So this concept of having little circles of say five people working on a particular issue and then coming and then some representatives coming to a larger group meeting. It's this is familiar to me. This is like how a well functioning organization tends to run, yeah. But you mentioned having two people representing. And that I have not seen. Generally I've seen one person representing a, a group. So why, why do we have two people? Well, really, at some, there's, there's different reasons, depending a little bit. Everybody has a little bit of their own, um, of their own context for it. So the way I think about it is if we look at hierarchical, typically hierarch like hierarchical contexts, okay? Mm. There we would have the balance restored of between the two teams because this person is sending a delegate to that group and this person this group is sending somebody to that group and now both of those people in the middle basically are full members of both groups so right. we have the balance between the two of them because it's not that person representing like it's not only a one-way kind of thing it's a two-way mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. we always make sure that information really flows everybody knows i am reporting here from that group and vice versa so that's mm -hmm. that's so. mm -hmm. the other one is um in volunteer context in particular, there's some redundancy that is good because yeah. what do you do if one if a group falls apart and you don't have the per person reporting because mm -hmm. because of things that happened. Um, but it really becomes it gets really interesting if you combine it with, with decision making because how we make decisions is slightly a little bit like consensus or very close to consensus depending on how you practice it. A decision is made when there's nobody who objects, like no, none of the team members object. 
But now that means that we have the redundancy of, let's say this circle has this as a, as a, as a child circle, so to speak, okay? And then this group makes a decision by consent. That means if one person from this group objects and says, no, we can't do that, then it doesn't move forward. So now we have this delegate from here representing that group in the next higher group, so to speak, high mm. holding lightly in the next broader group. Mm -hmm. That means because this person could object, this group cannot make a decision overpowering their child, so to speak, right. because of that safety measure. And the other way around. So it, it really it really is a pretty brilliant way that connection of double linking and consent decision making to make sure that teams between them, between yeah, th that the inter-team relationships is really balanced. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's a whole series of interesting points that here. The this idea of consensus decision making. I know a a lot of people have had experience with consensus decision making and being difficult to reach consensus. Uh, do you find that's an issue that has to be dealt with? Well, let me put a little bit of a finer point on that one. So the, um, and that's always a little tricky, the, the storytelling. So consensus typically is right that you're being asked, do you agree? Do you think we should do this kind of mm. thing? Um, the way we look at it, and it, we technically call it consent, is that a decision is not made when all agrees, when everybody agrees, but when nobody objects. And then mm -hmm. sometimes consensus people, and I know some people are really big believers of consensus, which I love, they will say, oh, that's what we mean. You know, like, yeah, problem is that's not always clear. Yeah. So, and here's my, here's my shortcut to, to explaining it. Um, I have five children. Mm -hmm. They all have different preferences. If I ask them, what do you think we should do on Saturday afternoon? I'm going to have five different opinions, right? And mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. asking the question the way I asked it just now, they will have the, I will have the um, expectation set that what they want is actually realistic in getting. Instead, what we do in sociocracy and consent decision making is we say, I think we should go to the pond. Is there any objection? Mm. So it, it turns the question upside down really. And now somebody would have to say, oh no, that doesn't work because in order to stop the decision. Ah. So it's not as easy to, you can't just say, I don't like it. But you have to say, oh, that doesn't work because, and then I as facilitator or we as a group can work with that, with whatever the reasoning was and can say, oh, you don't like the pond because it's gonna to be too cold. Okay, what could we do about that? You know, that's so that, that's also it. has a has an extra effect, which would be that whoever is kind of facilitating or leading or trying to create a direction actually has to have an idea to present in the in the first place, which means they need to have done their homework. Um, yes, you need to have proposals; otherwise, nothing is moving forward. Yes. Yeah. If you just talk, 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 but nobody dares to say, "Okay, I hereby propose we're going to the pond on Saturday afternoon." Nothing mm -hmm. is going to move. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing that I've been thinking about is how a lot of these these systems that you're talking about sound like they would apply to quite large groups. So if you're talking about a five five people in a team, you know, what if your group has only got seven people in it? Is is does sociocracy still apply in this very small group context? My experience is that, I mean, the, the short answer is yes. My experience is, however, that it works. How do I say this? So if people are inexperienced with it, they will have a harder time applying it in a small group than in a large right. group. Because in a large okay. group, it's not obvious why it, how it would work. And the, the smaller you get in a group, the more you really have to understand why you're doing what, and it has to become more of a static in nature. So for example, right. if you are only a group of three, Mm. you tend to become less uh, like more informal and then it's more yeah. then you go you sort of slide towards that consensus decision making again where you're trying to make everybody happy you would not be as rigid in like no i only want to hear objections right now you know and it, yeah, yeah. like that would be so but if you have people who are really used to this kind of way they mm -hmm. would still do it but I, I know i'm aware that a newly trained person would not do that probably yeah, so yeah, it's it easier to learn in a group where it's where it's more natural for people to behave that way so what kind of groups where are this, is this really useful for? Mm -hmm. Well, typically all groups that care equally about getting things out the door and about that egalitarian decision-making. 
So it tends to be groups like uh, co-ops, for example, it tends to be intentional communities, mm -hmm. uh, like co-housing, eco-villages and so on. It's really big there. Uh, it's big in schools also. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you have schools with a profile that are really into participatory um, decision-making and, and um, self, like the, the, the sense of autonomy of both mm -hmm. the students and the teachers and so on. Then nonprofits, of course, and then yes, also in for profits. The for profits have their own. That's that's its own world a little bit. Um, what I notice is that many people come to governance from other fields, because I always say, you know, like if you're 18 and you, you know, you graduate or 19, you graduate from high school, your first thought is not you want to, you know, look at governance. That's not typically something that people encounter that early in their lives. They typically <laughs> do projects, right? And then do another yeah, project, yeah. and then they do another project. And then they're like, gee, why doesn't this never, why does this never work out? And it, some people then come to us after, you know, years of organizing, go like, it, I realized it wasn't about this person or that person or this group. It was governance that was the problem. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how to how to govern ourselves, and then they then they encounter uh, things like sociocracy. So they often come either from some sort of activist group or any kind of project when they when they realize that, or they might come from permaculture, for example, because it's rather similar. Or they come from co-ops. They come from nonviolent communication, where they already encountered some sort of system and like design thinking that they saw and then it's a small step to to look at it under governance angle so how did you come to sociocracy how did you I, discover it i came to it really from community i moved into a, a co-housing community that is using it and um, i'm still here so i'm still uh, involved right. in, and still sociocratically um i had encountered non-violent communication before that so in a way sociocracy, one can think of it almost as scaling up nonviolent communication in, in terms of um, how it works. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my first career is, is um, sometimes sneaking in and how I think about it. Um, I'm really a linguist. So the whole idea of having interdependent systems was very close to how I thought anyway, because that's how language works. It's very interesting that every famous linguist I know is into um, political systems change. Well, we, we all it know seems it to it seems to really be be linked to linguistics. Yeah, and that's that's actually I've never really thought about it, but you know, like for example, for Chomsky, I've thought about it um, because, in particular, the way he changed linguistics was really this big thing of there's something deeply human about how we how we use language, right? And it's mm. actually our mind that is set up for for specific ways of like of how we use language and that mm. makes all languages equal you know like mm. any language any dialect anything is going to be exactly equal because it's all deeply human in how we form language so there's mm. something very egalitarian about it once you look at it yes um, so that's that's i think i see, I think that's I see. One of the drivers and linguists doing like oh it's all worth the same that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i uh, came across a, a fascinating study in um linguistics in Israel where a sign language has been born recently. Um, a new one? A new one from nowhere. They, the community had no sign language and they had a genetic defect that meant they had a lot of deaf people. Suddenly they needed, needed, a, needed a sign language and the sign language over the space of two generations appeared out of nowhere a fully formed language that was as complicated as other languages around the world and had no link to any other language in the world because it's obviously not linked to your spoken language and they didn't know any other sign language. So here was a language that just appeared and one generation learned to communicate basically with signs. The next generation immediately turned that into a fully fledged language that they could speak all, all topics in. It was like so fast. So humans just just communicate, yeah. And um, but and they but, use the systems that they have in that are, according to Chomsky, already preset in your brains of how how you're going to turn that input into an actual language. Mm. Yes. So, do you think we have this kind of inbuilt natural human way of communicating in in groups as well? Does this apply to the way groups always always function? 
I, I wish I knew. I guess the only thing I could say about that is that, first of all, that organizing is obviously something very natural that we tend to mm. do. I think just that we have so such a big backlog of messages that we internalize because we're being told all the time mm. Mm -hmm. that it's even hard to uncover. It's a little mm. bit, I mean, now it's sort of in linguistics and sociakas are organizing kind of um, comparison. There's a, so being being into Chomsky kind of grammar, I assume that everybody is a competent speaker of their language and whatever they say is what the language is because, because and I don't think you should mess with people's languages, right? You don't, you should not never police anything in a language in my view, because whatever it is, it is, that's what language is. That would be like, um, like policing what nature does. It just doesn't make sense to me. So, um, what I notice is that some people sometimes get tripped up in language when they've been policed a lot. Mm. Uh, like we you know when the English teacher said, never do this or never do that. And then, then, then it, they have this message, this external message coming, mm. but they also know how language works and they know what sounds right. And then they get that conflict and they don't know how to resolve it. And I think it's a little bit like that in organizing. You know, for example, we all have been told uh, somebody has to be the boss. Well, is that a natural way of organizing it? I don't know. I've been told so much. How would I know? You know? How would you know? <laughs> I don't know anymore. So, and I think many things that we do, I actually think about that quite a bit. It's funny that you would ask that because I was thinking about that last week of is consent a natural, natural decision-making method? And would there be a way of knowing? Because I see, I was watching kids play. That's why I thought about that. Mm. And uh, they were talking and oh, let's do this, let's do that. You know, like how kids between like seven and 10 spend, mm. their, spend their playing basically arguing about how to set up the game. Yeah. I'm going to do this and let's pretend I do that. And no, no, yeah. let's pretend this. Okay, this kind of stuff. But... And then from time to time, one of them would have an opinion. And then from time to time, one of them would say, okay, fine. You know, where basically what they're doing is they're accepting something that was the not- Consent, yeah. Right, they're basically consenting and then like, okay, given that I have this overarching aim of wanting to play with you, I'm willing to accept this mm. and we can move on and play. So basically in my interpretation, that's consent decision-making, except that they have a little bit of an edge to it. If a meeting somebody would say, fine, I consent, I would say, oh, hold, on. <laughs> hold on, I want to hear more. <laughs> you know? So maybe it's like a raw version of it, but it goes yeah. in the direction of we have things we want to do together and we have opinions and we somehow have to navigate what happens with that. Do you, have, that do you ever have discussions when there is is some disagreement do you ever have discussions that go on for a very long time in order to create this this sense of consent or is that something that's avoidable um yes because well it depends a little bit first of all how complicated the matter is and how deep it runs and so on uh, there are some really cool ways of shortening a decision making if people are up for it and well trained for it so for, so for example here's are three ways how we can integrate an objection um the first one I always teach is like, okay, sure, you can change something, right? That's easy. Let's actually use a concrete example. And a good example that I find works is let's say somebody says, let's redesign our website so that now, whatever, you might be switching some design elements, like your newsletter sign up is now on the bottom and this is at the top and this video is on the right instead, okay? So just something like that. And somebody says, oh, no, we, we can't do that because it, then people are not going to sign up anymore. They're not going to find the information, whatever it might be. Mm. So we would say, okay, that's the, the new web di website design was the proposal. And now somebody objects with the reason that they're worried that now people will not sign up for the mailing list anymore. Okay. So now we have three, three ways of dealing. One is we integrate the objection by modifying something. So for example, we could find some third way of ordering things that for some reason makes them happier and more confident that this is gonna work. Okay, sometimes that works, right? Then the second one is to put a term limit on it, like to have a short evaluation time. Like, okay, let's say we rearrange the website and we measure it, or, or sorry, we redesign the website and in four weeks, we're gonna look again, see what happened. So sometimes people get bought into this, like, oh God, if we do that, things are gonna be bad forever. Instead, we're saying, now hold on, how long are you willing to try it out? A month? Okay, let's do a month. And then let's talk then. The good thing about that kind of um, integration is that we don't have to always, um, 
work proposals until we think our guess is right, because really we're just guessing the whole time, right? All decision making is just guessing about what's going to work. So instead of hypothesizing what would happen, we try to find something that is good enough to try out. And then we try it out and then we see what actually happens. Instead of talking about it for months, we do something for a month and okay. then we do. Okay. Third one is measuring the concern. So we put some sort of metric in place and say, okay, so you're worried about that. Shall, shall we just measure? And as soon as we drop eight to like 80% level of what we typically get, um, we would, we would uh, sound alarm and have a meeting and see how to change it again. And you know? I like, so you actually work with a concern and see if you get your, can get right. your hands on real life data. So it sounds like from what you're saying that, that it takes some facilitation skill to make sure that um, discussions don't go on too long and it doesn't get too complicated. Certainly helps. And in particular, not only the facilitator needs to be trained, but everybody needs to be trained because you right. have to follow what they're doing and why they're doing it and so on. Right. So this is something where where the skill of communication skills of everyone in the group needs to be improved in order to be able to work in this way. Yeah, I would rephrase it. I would say the more people are trained and and comfortable in this kind of working, the better it will work. I don't want to present it like there is a threshold, like you have to have a certain level of training maturity mm. or what mm. you know. mm. Like, no, I mean, obviously, the more skill you have, the easier it will be, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously. Um, so I'm just looking at my questions and uh, making sure that I'm not missing anything. What kind of challenges do you come across when getting this, in, in order to get this system put into practice in, in the real world, you know? Yes, so the typical things are people trying to transform things without changing their ways. So they, um, they don't get everybody trained, for example. Uh, so right. training, not knowing enough of not feeding really at home in your system is the biggest issue by far. So that's mm -hmm. the one big one thing. Um, and in particular, because if you have people who are not comfortable because they don't know how it works, of course, they can never be as empowered and, and equal in decision making as the people who feel comfortable. So it's just a matter of really caring about the everybody's voice matters. Um, kind of principle to to really have everybody well trained. So that's that. The other one is all the stuff that gets stirred up by tinkering with power. It's just <laughs> all the things, you know, like for example. And you no, know, you can't take it from me. Yeah, that kind that, of yeah, that. Well, but also actually, I mean, yes, yeah, some people get pissed because they can't do their own thing and they can't just block decisions. You know, like they don't have the one one person show anymore. That's that's a big deal. They typically freak out before adoption. Like, so they typically, um, they typically are the resistors that don't want to do it because they're worried that they won't be able to do their own thing and have their way. So that's sort of the expectable thing. But there's something less expectable, and that typically happens, happens after adoption. And that's the people who realize that all of a sudden they are now co-responsible. And they're not always, always um, thrilled about that. So for example, that's what's a good example. I'll just describe a typical situation is when you have, let's say your group of six or seven people in a circle and there's a big decision. And then somebody feels like this is too big of a responsibility to make a decision, although they're it, right? They're the circle that makes the decision, but they're sort of tiptoeing around it. And then they try to, for example, abstain from the decision. So we now come to the moment, you know, like, so now after talking about it, this is the proposal, do you consent or do you object? And then people go like, ah, I don't know, <laughs> you know, and they try to find their way out of being responsible. And I, I liked very much in the training, I always quote that because it was so good. I was training and then somebody uh, summarized me and said, so Ted, what you mean is sociocracy or consent decision-making means no more excuses. And I said, that exactly that you are now congratulations you are now 100 percent responsible just like the rest that's quite something for people yeah right so it's the, it can be a real challenge for people to to own that right 
and then they will find their way to get themselves out of responsibility. You and know, and how do you get over that? I wish I knew. I wish I had a good answer for that. I think it really requires a lot of reflection because, and that's, I guess, that's where I actually hold the, the judgment that it's, that naturally every person is able and probably also willing to work this way, right? Mm. Everybody wants to have a say in how things are shaped around them, but some of us lose it along the way. That, that, so it's a little bit of like learned helplessness, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so people get comfortable in not having a say. So yeah, we also notice, for example, that it's quite a difference depending on how much um, exposure people already had to traditional organizing. So if you have people, let's say in the third part of their life, they often have more unlearning to do and have a much harder time with it than people in their early 20s. They just look at it and go like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, let's go. Yeah, right. But they don't <laughs> go have decades of crap that's put in their minds uh, that they first have to shake off. So it's much easier for younger people to learn, sadly. Mm-hmm. And have you seen seen groups come like have these kind of challenges and then get over them those challenges and kind of oh, yeah. settle into the new way yeah. yeah yeah no it's possible you know i'm really pointing out the hard ones but it, i mean the the yeah the struggles but no it's very well possible especially if everybody is really uh committed to learning and really excited but about, about finding a system that makes sense to people and that makes things easier for them because what mm. it does a lot of it creates that clarity of how do we decide on what basis and who decides what and you have total clarity on that at least as much clarity as you create for yourself and that is very liberating and empowering for groups once they have that are there any other advantages that it brings <laughs> any other that's already a big one that's a big <laughs> one yeah <laughs> it's a big one well and then ultimately you know people step into leadership roles so mm. For example, another little example is we chose we choose those people who are linking roles to the next higher circle, if you want to, right? Or, yeah. or any kind of role, also the role of the facilitator and the secretary, and all kind of operational roles that we um, that we define for ourselves, like the website person or something like something like that. Um, we select those by consent. So now let's imagine that let's say I am on the shy and inexperienced end of thing of things and I am selected as facilitator and now I'm tempted to object because I'm like, what? I, you know, like, God, that's so much responsibility and you might then object. And then the facilitator would go into the three ways of, of uh, integrating the objection. One is modifying it, go like, ah, I don't quite know how to see that. Maybe we could give Ted some additional training. Okay, so then we could shorten the term and say, okay, by let's say end of the year, um, you should have gotten training and we'll evaluate then how it's going for you. So basically you get this whole package of things of like, no, we want you to be facilitator, but you're gonna get training and it's gonna be reviewed and we get all the support to to you that you need. How about how about now? Mm-hmm. You know, then at some point you might be able to say, okay, I don't see any reason now to say no, I'm, I'm a, gonna try it. So what we see anecdotally, because there are no studies in that as far as I know yet, um, people who traditionally have not stepped into leadership roles all of a sudden find themselves in leadership roles. So that's pretty big. It changes the whole culture of who is in leadership positions because we select people who get everybody's consent instead of the person who screams the loudest or says about themselves that they're the most experienced and so on. I like I like you're talking about leadership because we've we've been talking about equality, and I, I know a lot of people think of equality as not having leaders, oh. um, but I don't see it that way, and obviously you don't either. No, not at all, not at all. Yeah. So how I, can you? How can we have leaders without losing equality? Well, one for me is that consent is that safety measure. It is intentional. It's it's chosen, right? So first of all, mm-hmm. if I'm the leader, then I'm chosen by consent. I have everybody's consent that I'm playing that role for a certain period of time. So mm-hmm. let's say in my organization, I'm operational leader, leader of the the central circle, and everybody gave me their consent that I would that I would be that for. I think back then it was two years or maybe one year. I don't remember mm-hmm. right now. Uh, so that's a big difference. Uh, it is also more clear what well i find it more clear what my job is because i because we make decision by we decide by consent what we sign up to do Mm -hmm. and then the leader 
holds people accountable to their own word, but I'm not bossing people around, right? Because they already said they would. All I have to do is say like, hey, you know, Nora, what's, I, I realize you haven't done this and that yet. What's happening with that? So it's a completely different vibe. What we need is that accountability, like somebody who pays attention paying attention and really having a vision of, oh, okay, if we decide that this month, then in December we could go there. And then ultimately we're gonna reach the goal that we together decided we want to reach by mid next year. And like, so it's that it's that vision and, and really getting people on board and, and making sure that you have um, both the people and the project um, paid enough attention to. So that's what leadership becomes in a consent-based system. So paying attention really, taking an interest in that area, which maybe maybe others are busy with their own little areas and so they're not not paying attention to that, that and overview. That, right, and that for me is where I see people struggle for, for perfect reasons, right? Because we all tend to think of ourselves as being short on time and my experience is that we're all short on attention. And I don't mean, you know, the sort of, we have a all short attention span due to social media, that's not what I mean. But just there's so many things pulling, right? And so, so few of us even have the bandwidth to still take yet another project from beginning to end. So that it just takes, yeah, it just takes the bandwidth to do that. So that's that's what a leader needs to do. And that's that's how we select people into leadership. Like, do we think that you can do that? Yeah, I really feel like I can only take one intention. And so I can take the intention to lead a whole organization and including all of the little bits in it, sure. But I can't take the intention to do the marketing and on the other side to do the, the design because they're two separate things. I could see the whole pattern and kind of include a bit of marketing and design in there. But for me, it's like one thing, one thing, whether it's the big pattern or it's the little thing, one thing is where the intention is. And I guess uh, the leader is in this sense, the central organizer or the team leader or whoever is the one who's taking that intention for the whole rather than for a, a particular part. Right, and then of course we can nest sub-circles mm. wherever we need them, right? So we can yeah. we can build those meaningful chunks that make it easy for our brain to even mm -hmm. pay attention to them, right? Like let's say marketing now has three big projects in it. We would still have a circle on each of that, that each have a leader. So, so yeah. it's always like, what are you paying attention to? Which level, and that also then comes with mm -hmm. a level of detail, mm -hmm. which then goes back to that natural hierarchy and, and fractal nature of things. And that I find is very much aligned with what I've seen in linguistics of how the mind works because we do this right. next thing of sort of meaningful chunks a lot mm -hmm. um, so that yeah in in general um recursion is is something that our, that our brain uses a lot so that's that's basically that design principle yeah and um i kind of imagine leadership like the, the old idea of leadership the boss is sits above and pushes everybody around, you know, like you know, the pawns on the chessboard. Um, but this kind of equal leadership is more like holding, holding some container that allows everybody to do their own thing within it. So we're not pushing around, but we're just holding a space that allows for other people the room to express themselves freely in, inside it. Right, and detecting disturbances. Yeah, the way I think, I mean, I like your, I like your image, I guess the, the way I, yeah, because I also, I, I think in images myself. So my image is, um, it's like sitting in the middle and just listening, right, to what's happening. Or like, oh, right. there's a disturbance there. They need something, you know, like this seems to be going well. Like just really, yeah, that's, that's the, the paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So we have a question here about in what context is this model most useful? Now, we already talked about this a little bit, but there's the idea come up that does this apply in only in communities and corporations or can it be applied at a larger level, say governments and, and uh, really large systems? Yeah. So there are two kinds of large systems. One is a large system that is large because we have... Um, 
we have a lot of people involved that are all involved in some place. So for example, I will give you an example that actually exists. Um, mm -hmm. It's the neighborhood parliaments in India. Mm -hmm. They organize neighborhoods of 30 people. And so they have a bunch of neighborhoods and they each send in this case, one representative to the next layer. Mm -hmm. And then the next layer, they it goes, I think it takes, I think it's 11 layers to the national level. Mm -hmm. So not, I mean, not everybody in India is part of that, obviously, otherwise we would all hear about it, but there are hundreds of thousands of people organized that way already. So this is already, this is not, you know, hypothetical, this is already done. And they use uh, sociocratic uh, selection processes quite, quite a bit, at least in the children's uh, department of it, um, a lot and consent and so on. So why am I saying this? Oh, because they are representing people, right? So that would be one way of organizing. And what I love about that vision is that it puts so much power and so much relationship on a very grassroots level that whoever is the leader of the national level doesn't even matter. Like we don't even have to care because so much is already taken care of right. on a level where it makes much more sense. The other way, so that's organizing people into these, into these um, meaningful chunks. Yet sociocracy really was invented for organizations. And that's a little different because for example, if you take my town, um, I think 80,000 people in my town. And how many people does it take to run the town? It takes, let's, let's say, I don't actually know, but let's say it takes 500 people to run the town, mm. okay? Then how do we represent the other 79,500 people? Mm. Like, where are they if they're not in a working circle that we need to run the town? Mm. You see, so that's why organizational governance, the way circles are really the workers that are also decision makers that doesn't easily transfer into more representative kind of sets where we have a, a large group of people that are not actively involved in running the town. So that's different. And there are different ideas that I have about how to connect it. Um, but it's, I guess my point is just that sociocracy was never intended for, for government right, right. countries, for organizations. The, uh... USSR tried to do it with Soviets um, and they had some some benefits and some drawbacks. Obviously, it's an idea that people have been tossing around, um, but we're yet to see the real perfect, uh, perfect solution there. At least I'm yet to see it. Maybe somebody else has come up with it. If you have come up with it or you know somebody who knows, then you better tell us so that we can interview them. Um, so you belong to an organization called Sociocracy for All. Uh, can you tell me about exactly what you do in that organization? Yeah, so Sociocracy for All, so far we call it in short, is about four years old at this point. We have about 116 volunteer members all over the world, really. Lots in um, Spanish-speaking countries, Europe, US, mm -hmm. US mm -hmm. and um, about seven people in paid roles. And what we do is we, um, and I'm one of the co-founders, so me and my partner, Jerry, we founded it uh, because what we wanted was we wanted sociocracy to be accessible to everybody, not just, you know, your shiny consulting firms. That's very sweet. And I'm not saying they shouldn't use it. I'm just saying we also need it in all kinds of other places. Mm -hmm. And we in particular need it in places that are underfunded because that's where there's a lot of grassroots organizing and so on. So we didn't want to contribute to a world where it's the, high, the, the high-end paying clients that get this kind of stuff while the people who are in underfunded um, situations have to organize in less effective ways. So just anyway, so for us, this is social change work. That's the bottom line. Right. It's social change work. Everybody should have a right to um, access information that helps them to organize instead of having to resort to what we've been told and, um, and shown like hierarchic organizations and um, or top down chorus of organizations and sort of the very horizontal loose and not as effective organizations. So we wanted to put it on the map mm -hmm. and have been doing that for a while and quite successfully so far. So if you belong to an organization that needs some sociocracy or at least some of the ideas from it would like to talk to sociocracy for all, how, do, how would somebody find you? 
we put well one is our website so mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. we what we try to do because it is really in alignment with how we how we think about what we want to do is we tend to automate a lot of things so for example on our website you find lots of videos that you can just go watch so mm -hmm. that's about the accessibility right good information accessible to everybody so there's a lot of that and then one interesting thing that um really also highlights how we think about things is that we have a um a training program that's really a set of videos that small groups can watch together and it always goes back and forth between you first watch the video for five minutes and then it turns into an exercise and then you do the exercise oh, okay, you, okay. you always go back and forth back and forth the advantage of that is first of all you can have you know thousands of people doing that without me having to lift a finger in theory mm. so it's very accessible, very affordable for that reason. And it strengthens those small decentralized groups because not everybody who's closer, who lives closer to a soci sociocracy trainer will get trained, but wherever you are and you have internet connection, you can do it. And of course, of course, I'm aware that comes of course with the obstacle of, for example, it's in English. Uh, that's of course an obstacle. We also have a Spanish version and we are working on translating as much as we can and have the means to do. Um, hold on, there was another thing I wanted to say about this. Um, yeah. Sociocracyforall.org. Yes. Just to remind you the nine people, the web address. Yes. Um, well, yes. Yeah, so the, um, the three things that we do is the f access to resources. Then the other one is, and, and that includes training and, you know, training, control, and consulting, coaching, and all those things. Then networking people and the translation of things. So to make sure that it's really um, accessible and in, in languages that people speak. You talked about social change. What kind of, do you see this as being a, a change to the system of society in general that's needed or only um, change to the kind of projects we're doing? Well, I guess, um, let's see. So ultimately, I think it's going to um, transform everything yet in an indirect way. What I'm, what's sort of on my horizon is I want to raise the bar for people and people's expectations of what kind of organizing and decision making they find acceptable and good. Mm -hmm. So, for example, mm -hmm. most people walk around saying that voting is the, and demo, you know, the democracy coming with majority vote is the best thing ever. Go like, well, that's a really low bar for what the expectation is. <laughs> You're telling me that 94 point whatever people of percent of the people can be ignored in a country that's really a low bar. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yet we've been told so many times that that's the best thing that many of us never really actually go like, well, oh, hold on, is it actually the best thing? You know, so that's where the storytelling has been so I've got it. I've got a good quote about that. Democracy... Right is the worst governmental system except for all the other ones. Yes, exactly that. So I, what I want to do is raise the bar that people go like, yeah. hold on, there's actually better ways of organizing. Could this be done better instead of just leaning back and saying, well, we're democratic, that's all there is, right? So mm -hmm. that's the end of everything. No, it's not the end, it's pretty good. And yet let's make it better. So what I want to do is just basically on the very level of let's say a meeting, we don't have to, ex um, we don't have to accept a meeting where basically one person is talking that's not that's that's maybe what we all got used to but mm -hmm. i want to raise the bar of like no no that is a pretty bad meeting in the first place if it's set that up set set up that way so, so do you see to participatory more participatory structures in general so do you see sociology playing an, uh, a role in changing the the global system towards something more like this yeah, because I think it would put more power on a grassroots level. So we would empower people to change things where they are on matters that affect them. And then ultimately things will be taken care of more, like, yeah, further, further below, so to speak. Uh, so that, um, yeah, because people on the ground tend to care about, like, for example, let's look at climate change. People on the ground tend to care about these kind of things, right? So they with the level of um, organizing that is an obstacle right now so with better organizing and um, more resource then generated on the grassroots level people could be doing all kinds of things so that's mm. that's a big hope of mine so 
we are the systems change alliance, of course. And so we assume that if you're agreeing to an interview with us, that you believe in systems change. Um, what three systemic changes do you think the world needs now? Three, I only have three. <laughs> three system changes. One big systems change that I would like to see is changes in ownership structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you already talked about um, cooperative uh, forms of, of ownership, for example, that's big, but even more, maybe more in that direction is I'm very interested in the commons, strengthening the commons. The of commons. Course, yeah, no. but um, so the idea that there are things that just belong to everybody, that mm -hmm. private ownership is not even a thing that we should, for example, yeah. allow for, you know, the easy examples are air, water, yeah. you know, yeah. like, <laughs> how could that even be owned by anybody? It just doesn't really make sense. And then there's great, great, um, there's been great studies, like a big um, body of research on, on how to successfully govern things together, like taking care, stewardship of, for example, a lake or something like that. Uh, so something that is not owned by one person or one corporation or even a set of people just by everybody and some people taking on the stewardship of it. Mm. So that's that as a as a model of ownership, just more more towards. No, this is just something that not one person can buy. This is just not something that can be bought in the first place. That will be something that's exciting to me. Yeah, right. Um, does that count as one? <laughs> <laughs> one I big guess, one. The next, I know. The, and then another one is just, I wish, and I don't, I don't have a lot of expertise, but it's something that's dear to my heart, just education. And I guess because we all, it rises to my consciousness also because because all the things of disempower, all the messages of disempowerment uh, that we've already talked about now in the last 45 minutes, uh, they are basically being perpetuated by, by school education so much. Um, it's, yeah, it seems that people come out disempowered at the end of schooling quite a bit. And that's something that, that saddens me because it sets the foundation for people, right? And how they enter the workforce then mm. um, and how they think about what their role is in their job in the first place. Um, so that's, an, th that those internalized messages are a problem for, so for example, for sociocracy, if you don't think you can even be in charge because you've told so much that you can't, been told so much that you can't. So a more empowering education system. Right. Yeah, one, one little, little thing that might be actually a little highlight on, on just what consent means. Um, what I notice is that, that, you know, as I said, I have five kids so I'm, and thanks to remote schooling, I, I see even more of, of their schoolwork these days. And just a sense that their perception of what is what is appropriate or what is relevant and what is interesting and so on gets overridden so much, right? Um, and it, it's um, it's very related in my mind to, um, for example, somebody's right over their own body. You know, like sexual consent, for example. You know, like we are not we are not doing a good job at. Um, protecting the integrity of young people for what they care about, what's interesting to them, their own body, like all of that, you know, that all of that, we're basically um, getting their sense of integrity and what am I in consent with out of them so early that it's hard to find it again later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've got one more. Have you got a third one? Uh, I do not actually. <laughs> okay, we'll have to turn that into three. You've got education, consent, and what was the first one? Uh, the economic changes. Yeah, econ oh, the ownership. Ownership. ownership yes. yeah. Okay. okay, lovely to have you with us. Um, well, hope we'll speak again very soon. Thank you, Alexander. And you can find, once again, you can find sociocracyforall.org if you want to know more.